。那接下来呢，就是要进入到我们这个创业航海家论坛，四位创业家的精彩分享。那我我这边先简单介绍一下，呃，第一位的讲者就是刚才呃主办单位还有国发会都有提到的，也是这次的这个客座创业家 C t F O 的创办人 Sandy Camper。他其实是从一个美国的小城市开始做了一个呃 FinTech 的这个服务，但是把它推广到全球。所以今天的这个分享呢，他就会跟大家呃 share 更多他怎么样呃在创业的这个。历程当中呢，把他的这个东西呢，呃，推广到全球的这个市场，所以呢，就请大家跟着我一起来，呃，掌声欢迎我们的这个 C Two F O 的创办人 Sandy Camper 上台来分享。Let's welcome Mr. Camper. Is am I on? I'm on. Good. It's a great honor. To be here, in particular, it's a great honor for me to be in a room full of entrepreneurs. I'm one of you, and I know we all start down this journey thinking it's the only thing in front of us, and there's no there's no point of reference looking backwards. But I think there's a lot of history that we can learn from our、uh, our prior time and prior successes. So what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about C2FO, the company we started. And then I'm going to break it down into components of success for us that might have application for you as you think about your business. So, just a quick show of hands: How many folks in the room today have started their own company? How many want to start their own company? Just get your hands up. We need more hands over here. So you're here because you want to build something great. You want to do something that differentiates you from everybody else in the world, and there's no better platform, no better way to differentiate, no better way to put a dent in the universe than to build your own company. Now, what's it take to build a company? Well, for us, it's a problem. Find a problem that you can solve. We all know that there are there's plenty of problems from which to choose. So make it a personal problem. Something that excites you and creates passion in you, that you can solve and feel good about solving, even if no one else in the world cares. It's better if they do, because then they're going to buy your solution and make your company great. But make that first step finding a personal problem. So for us, one of the very first big companies I started back in 2000 was a company called eScout. It later became Perfect Commerce. It still exists today. It's one of the very large electronic commerce marketplaces. But during the early 2000s, it was very, very hard time. There was no bank lending. There was no venture capital. We funded ourselves in 1999, but by 2001, it was a nuclear winter for all things technology. Now we were lucky. We had some good business. We had some good revenue, but those companies weren't paying us fast enough. So we were about ready to run out of cash. And my CFO came to me and said, "You've got to put more money in the business, or you've got to find a loan, or you've got to find more venture capital." And we couldn't find a loan, and I didn't have any more money to put in the business, and there certainly wasn't any more venture capital. So we did what we what we had to do. We called the customers up that owed us money. Right, their account payable was our account receivable. Well, that that moment of difficulty. Gave birth to the idea that it's possible, maybe, to build a marketplace where people who need money can get that money from the companies that they're doing business with, who have that money. Everyone's account payable is someone else's account receivable. Remove the intermediary. Take away the friction. And create a match between the AP and the AR, and you might be able to solve the problem. So it was born of difficulty for us, a challenge. We were almost ready to go broke. We didn't have the money to be able to go forward to pay our salaries that next week. But we approached one of our customers. They paid us early at a discount, and we had the cash necessary to go forward. Fast forward ten years, and the idea to create a company around this was born. I had some good friends who came with me, so for me, it's always about the problem, then finding the right people, building the right product, and then finding your first customer. 
And it should work. Oh, way to go back. Sorry. So in the company itself, this company called C2FO was born in 2008. In 2010, we had our first market transaction, meaning the first trade on our platform. Every quarter since that first quarter of 2010, we've grown at 70% per quarter. So every quarter, every three months, we've almost doubled time and time again since the inception of the company. The problem, it turns out, was a really big problem that lots of big companies and lots of suppliers had. How do I get cash in order to keep my business growing when I'm owed cash by the people who, brought, who bought product from me? Well, this is great. These are all wonderful things, but I only show this to you to show that it's a journey. You start small. You can get bigger if your problem and your people are capable enough. This is the very first customer we were able to land. So for you, the same thing. Problem, people, product, and then whatever it takes. Doesn't matter that your product's not exactly right. Doesn't matter that it's, it's not perfect. Put the product into production. Get it out there. Find people who want to help you grow and change that product to make it better. Our first customer was Toys R Us. And all these dots that you see here, these are all customers of ours now. So the, all the dots that go around this graph, all 250,000 of them, are suppliers in our marketplaces today. But we started small. We didn't try to boil the ocean on day one. We didn't try to do everything and be everything to all people. We wanted to create something good, something true, something that would work for one customer and their suppliers. And that's, that's the exchange or the market we built for Toys R Us. This is what it looks like today. A quarter million customers across the world, 61 countries, multiple languages, multiple currencies, building a network of connectivity between companies who are doing business with each other so that cash flow can move back and forth between the supplier and the buyer more effectively. The green lines, and, and I'm sure you all know this, the green lines, in a network business, what you want is a great number of connections. You want to have as many connection points as you can in your company. So for us, the green lines are multiple connections from one supplier to multiple buyers. So it's almost like a dial tone for telecommunications. We're dial tone for cash traded between companies. Now, I think one of the reasons I'm here is because I'm from Kansas City. This is a very small town in the middle of the United States. And um, I live on a ranch. I have cowboy boots. I actually have horses and uh, chickens and, and sheep on my ranch. And we built the largest market in the world for working capital from this little ranch in this little town called Kansas City. Now, what's fascinating to me is that Kansas City was once the jumping off point for all of the westward expansion across the United States. All the cowboys and their battles with the Indians and all the covered wagons all came out of Kansas City. It was a very entrepreneurial city. Very entrepreneurial city, but one of the successes, one of the problems of the city was that it became successful and became complacent. So this is one of the other lessons, I think, as you, as you grow your business, always remain hungry. A lot of the people who, with whom you'll compete, a lot of the incumbents that you want to take out with your entrepreneurial solution, they've already had so much success that they're not hungry anymore. They're not innovating, they're not growing, they're not driving, they're not pushing. And that's what we as entrepreneurs do. We drive, we have passion, we believe in our product, we believe in the problem we're solving. All these people that went from Kansas City to California and to New Mexico to Oregon, they all came through Kansas City pursuing dreams of a better life for themselves, a better solution for their families. Much the way you dream about building a business or growing the business you've already built, they dreamed the same thing about creating new life for themselves further out in, Can in, in the United States. Kansas City is also a great jumping off point for the railroads. The railroads were very important for the economic development of the United States. One of the things that I think we don't have to deal with as entrepreneurs today is the infrastructure cost of fixed assets to create economic success. So how many of those that raised your hands are building 
software companies, virtual companies without a tremendous amount of physical cost. It, it, today we can build companies cheaper than we've ever been able to build, faster than we've ever been able to do. We don't have to worry about covered wagons and trails. We don't have to worry about railroad lines and, and capital expenditure in order to achieve our dream. This, um, this is a great picture here because this is, this is the Union Station where all those trains came and went. This is, a, this is a better picture of it. This is after the Kansas City Royals won the World Series in 2016. And do you know who was pitching for us in 2016? I do, if I can get this to work. This guy. So we have a connection in uh, Kansas City also to uh, Taiwan. So I want to say thank you for this great pitcher who made our baseball team capable of winning the World Series. And I want to then move forward to something else that I think is very similar between our cities. This is the expansion long, long before Kansas City had its expansion. This is the expansion across the Australasian uh, landmass and waters that was led by Taiwan. All of the proto-languages that exist in the Australasian region of this territory trace back to the roots of this island. It's in our DNA, whether it's the westward expansion of the covered wagons or the railroads or the ocean expansion 3,000 years ago led by the people of this island, we've always been adventurers. We've always wanted to press forward and do more. Today, you're the new generation doing exactly what has been done before you. So the past is a prologue. What's happened in the past can teach us about the risks we need to take in the future. I'm here to tell you that the risks are a lot easier now than they were 3,000 years ago when the people in this island explored the waters all around Australasia in little boats with sails. Thank God we don't have to do that. We don't have to fight the Indians in the United States. We have the capacity to build businesses out of the ether, to create virtual companies that can put a dent in the world's economy. I'll frame up the problem for you that we address with our company in hopes that you can think the same way about a problem you can fix. It turns out that it wasn't just a personal problem, that we couldn't get cash in that tough time for my earlier company. In 2001, when things were really difficult, it was difficult for everybody. And it turns out that it wasn't just related to time, it was a monster problem that affected businesses around the world. On any given day in the world, there's 42 to $43 trillion of accounts receivable on the books of businesses. There's only two to three trillion dollars of bank finance, factoring and financial institution lending, trying to create liquidity against that 43 trillion dollars. The system is broken. So if you, can, if you can find a personal problem and you can find people to go with you to solve your problem, to build something great, and if the market is big enough, you will build a company that will change the world. It doesn't matter that you're not in Silicon Valley, look at me. A cowboy living on a ranch with great people, able to build with 150 people a market that's changed working capital around the world. You've got, you've got the past as prologue. You've built this before. You, your people have done the exact same thing time and generation and generation and generation. You're going to do the same thing for your company. I hope your problem will be as big as this and that you've got the opportunity to solve it. Start with hiring those great people. I was lucky that the people who came with me to C2FO, many of them had been with me at other businesses that I started. As you, as you meet your, your partners, your co-founders, don't let go of that network. I know we're busy. I like to think about capital in three buckets. Human capital or social capital, financial capital, and intellectual capital. All of us when we start our business are thinking about intellectual capital. I want my business to be good. I want my product to be smart. I want my solution to be clever. Oh, and I better raise money. I better, I better have revenue. So the next thing you think about is financial capital. It's very, very hard to fill all three buckets up 
but you have to, have to, have to fill up your social capital bucket. The reason that the businesses I've been involved with have been successful has very little to do with me. It has entirely to do with the people who came with me to build these businesses, and that is social capital. Of those three baskets of capital, financial, intellectual, social, most of you in this room before I made this talk would have said financial capital, intellectual capital are the most important. They are not. Social capital. Social capital, your network, your people, because it's people that make companies great. Your connection to those people will make your next company great. Fine, now you've got your people, build your product. Just like we did for Toys R Us, get it out there as fast as you can. You can change it. You're not laying railroad tracks. You don't have to rip up the railroad track and go back and put in new track. It's, it's virtual. It's on the internet, most likely. It's an app or it's something that you've built without a lot of physical cost. Get it out there, get the feedback from the client, and change. Find giraffes. You know what a giraffe is? Someone who's willing to stick their neck out for you. All right, that might be an investor, but for us, it was revenue. Toys R Us was our giraffe. It's somewhat appropriate as well because the mascot for Toys R Us is a giraffe. So here was this company who took a, who took a, a risk on us because they liked our people, they liked our product, they liked our solution. Uh, and I might add, if you can build your product in a way that does not require your client to pay a lot of money for it at first, that's a very good solution as well. The way we charge inside C2FO is as a percentage of the revenue that we generate for our customers. So if we find 20 or 30 or 40 million dollars of new revenue through discounts in the marketplace for Costco or for Walgreens or for a big company like Pfizer or another company like Amazon, all of whom are clients of ours, then they share with us some of that revenue that we created for them. So there's no risk in them going forward with us. We de-risked them to move rapidly because we didn't charge them a lot of money at first. Now, there's something more that comes with that. In today's world, it's not just about the revenue that you extract for the the first phase of your solution. It's about the secondary and tertiary follow-on revenue streams. So today, and I'm sure this is something you've thought about before, but today in our company, we touch about 500 million invoices every month. Imagine the data that comes from those invoices. Yes, we're making money for Toys R Us and Amazon, and we're making money for Flextronics and Hewlett Packard, but we're also capturing tremendous amounts of data from all of the invoices that are coming in, a half billion invoices a month, from which we can extract data to make good solutions and good, good product changes, maybe even new products, based on the data that we're gathering from those invoices for our customers, the suppliers. Our goal, and this is, this is important, I think, for all of you, at least for me it is, have one true North Star. You know, as you're going off, whether you're gonna go on the ocean or you're gonna go on land, the way you navigate at night is to look at the stars. And to look at the North Star in particular, because it's always north in the sky. And in the Northern Hemisphere, that's the way everyone guided themselves before they had technology was to, to navigate from the stars. Find one North Star for your company, and you'll make it, I think, simple and easy to answer the complex questions that your company's gonna face. What's our North Star? Our North Star is we exist to liberate working capital. It's trapped. It's in bank balance sheets, or it's on balance sheets of large corporations. Our whole purpose is to liberate working capital. That one North Star. So that when you have this hard, complex question of should we, should we look at this product over here or should we look at this product over here? Well, not unless it ties into the North Star. Death comes from doing too many things too early in your company. 
Do not try to boil the ocean. Get that product, get that customer, get it out there, learn and grow it, and stay true to your North Star. I've seen more companies die because they try to boil the ocean. They try to embrace everything. They want option A and option B and product C and product D and service E. That's not going to work. Be true to yourself, have your North Star, do one thing very, very, very well, and your company will have a greater chance for success than those who try to do many things in a mediocre way. Uh, the reason this slide is up here is because this is the log on to our admin page. This gives us a view of every invoice, every dollar, every working capital trade, every supplier, every business, around 61 countries across the globe. One simple log on, the way you borrow the, we borrow the screenshot of the, uh, the railroad station, to tell us if our trains are running on time, except our trains aren't tied to railroad tracks, they're virtual connectivity between buyers and suppliers for a half billion invoices each and every month. So the data in today's world might actually be more valuable than the product you set out to build and charge for on day one. Never, never forget that there are secondary and tertiary value propositions to what you do that still line up with your North Star. And we're about ready to wrap up, and I hope there's gonna be some questions, because I'd love to take your questions. Nothing makes me more excited than talking to entrepreneurs about what you're going through. So I've talked a little bit about what we're doing. I wanna hear what you guys are doing as soon as I finish these slides. So very quickly, be transparent. You build your business. If you're not transparent, you're just kidding yourself. Your people are gonna find out how you're doing. They're gonna find out how the products are working. They're gonna find out where you're making money. They're gonna find out all that stuff, because today's world information is everywhere and the good people know exactly where to get it. So just beat them to the race. Let everything in your company be transparent. And our company, every month, here's where the profits are, here's where the revenues are. We sit down and go through a grade card with all of our associates every month, scoring out not just the numbers and the profit and the revenues, but grades. How are we doing? A plus, B minus, C, F. We give ourselves a grade card every month and we share it with everyone in the company. Put the company first, well that's obvious. Yeah, I know you're building a company because you want to do something that differentiates yourself, but it's the company that does it, not you. It's the people that you bring in, it's the customers that you keep. It's the networks that you build. It's not about you, it's about your company. Act like everyone is watching because you know why? They are. Everybody is watching. Your customers, your associates, your peers, your network, everyone's watching you what time you come to work, what time you leave work, how are you working on the weekends, what sort of solutions, are you a, are you a good partner, a bad partner, do you have a temper, do you have kindness in your heart? Everyone, everyone, especially when you're a founder, everyone watches you, everyone, like a microscope. So try to be as good as you can because if you're not, they're gonna find out. Know why you're here? Well, that's your North Star. Why is more important than what? Why is more important than how? Why is even more important than when? I know we all have to be fast and get things done because we're in, a, in an internet speed driven world. Why is the most important thing you've got? Why of your company? Why does it matter? Why do customers care? Why are your people there? Why are you there? Answer why and everything else falls into place. Number one rule for me when I'm interviewing people, I want there to be a cultural fit, but if they don't have curiosity, they don't come to the company. They have to be curious. They have to always want to learn. They want to be passionate, yeah, sure. They want to be hard, hard charging and work hard, yeah, fine. But curiosity, you guys are building something brand new. If you're not curious, you're gonna screw it up. If you're not exploring, if you're not trying new things, you're gonna, you're gonna not be able to do what everyone else has done because whatever, whatever you're doing needs to break what everyone else has done. You're building something new, so you have to be curious. Do things quickly, act with alacrity, urgency. Uh, most important one in our company and one, one sometimes that I screw up, I have very strong opinions as a founder and I probably hold them too tightly it's great, have your, have your really strong opinions, but hold them loosely. Don't be stubborn about them. Fight hard, 
debate hard, have hard conversations, but hold on, hold on loosely because the people that you hired, the people that you have around you, it's their company too. You'll make better decisions with good people and having strong debates if you hold your opinions loosely. And then learn every day. Right, you're here because you want to learn. You're here at this conference on a Saturday because you want to learn. Hopefully I've, I've given you something that's going to be helpful as you learn. But we're all here because we want to be stimulated by what we do. We don't want to work in a big company and be told what to do. We want to do the things that we think are important because we're solving big problems. We're entrepreneurs because we're not cut out to fit in the mold that everyone else wants us to fit into. We're unique, we're different, we're driven, we're passionate, we're curious. We have an appetite for learning. Now there you go. Talent, passion, centers of commerce. Your tower is a little bit bigger than our tower though. This is uh, not quite to scale for the Kansas City Tower. Your tower is much, much more beautiful and uh, much larger. So. I'll turn it over to questions, but I also want to say to each and every one of you, um, this is the most important thing you're going to do. To me, yeah, family, okay, family is the most important thing you're going to do, but in the business world, starting your business, building something, trying to make a dent in the universe, nothing better than it. So I wish you all uh, great good luck. So questions, uh, we, have, uh, we have four or five minutes. I'd love to have questions or comments, maybe something I didn't explain properly or something that you're trying to solve in your business that I might be able to help. So please, questions. We have about Hi, my name is Ryan. Um, just wondering, you said that you hold your opinion very tightly. So can you share with us, what if the fight goes on really fierce? <laughs> and then if the really bad thing happens, you know, how do you s separate with your partners? That's what uh, I'm curious. Yeah, so again, this is a, uh, so I'll give you, I'll give you a really great question. Did you guys hear it? So it's what happens when they're not holding their opinions loosely and you can't get consensus. So very early on in our business, all right, I'm going, to ask, I'm going to ask you guys the question. So you know the problem. We're going to do a quick group exercise. You know what our true North Star is, right? To liberate working capital. You saw the 250,000 dots on the screen. You also saw our very first customer was a big guy like Toys R Us, and we've got Amazon and Intel and Flex and HP and all that stuff. Who's our customer? How many people think our customer is the buyer, the big company? How many of you think the customer is the supplier? Show of hands. Buyer? Oh, don't be shy. How many people think that the customer is the buyer? Good. How many people think the customer is the supplier? So this was a huge debate for us. Same, same thing probably you're going through too, right? Who's our customer? Well, we decided very early on. Everyone wanted to split the baby. Everyone wanted to say, well, we're a two-sided marketplace. The buyer and the supplier are customers. Our customer is the supplier. Why? Because there's a hell of a lot more of them than there are buyers. One. Two, there's better nobility of cause. It's more noble to help the little guy than to make money for the big guy. So we just culturally uh, aligned with them. Now coming back to your problem, certain people completely disagreed and it was a battle royal for probably a month. And uh, finally, I, I'm the founder, finally, I said, well, enough of the debate. Our customer is a supplier, and if you don't agree, then you need to leave. And, and happily, it was the right choice. Uh, we lost one person because of that, but then those that stayed were very aligned. And we've been aligned for almost a decade now on taking care of that singular customer, our supplier. Why is that important? Because if it was the buyer, we might be trying to make more money from the supplier than we should be. We might try to take advantage of a little bit of the supplier to give benefit to the buyer. And then that supplier wouldn't come back to the market. Because if you feel you're taken advantage of when you're getting your, your supplies or your products just the way the supplier is getting their cash, if you feel that you've been cheated, you're not going to go there anymore. You're not going to go to the market. You're not going to go to the store. You're not going to buy that product again. So it, it felt like the right decision and it's guided us ever since. 
Okay, one, one more question. Two more questions. Hi, Mr. Kempers. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I have a question about the uh, secondary value you were talking about, the big data thing, because I, I was very curious what you, your thoughts about when you come up with this idea of using that data from, from customers to build the value. And yeah. I don't know if you noticed that, but nowadays all the internet companies wants to use big data. Yeah. And that for consumers, I don't know how you feel, but it's kind of annoying now. Because everybody wants to I have agree. their information. And at one point you just say, I, don't, I just don't want to use it anymore. So I think, I mean, do companies need to decide what is their primary? And how important really is big data? Is that Good. actually a problem? So the questions about that comment I made about data. And, and using data as a secondary revenue source. If we were using the data to market something to the supplier to say, come look at this insurance policy or come look at this product I want to sell you, that would be a little problematic for us. I think data used to satisfy something the supplier truly wants that aligns with your North Star is actually a benefit to the supplier. I'll give you an example. The data we use today, we never sell to anyone else. We only use it to do something that we created a year ago. It's a fund that gives money to suppliers when their buyers run out of money. It gives money to suppliers when we don't have all of their buyers. So imagine, imagine that we have a supplier with 15 connections in the market, 15 big buyers, but that supplier is also selling to buyers that we don't have in the market because we haven't put them into C2FO yet. We have enough data about how that supplier is doing with all these buyers in our market to be able to say, you're a really good supplier, so we're going to give you some of our money as if we were your buyer. So we didn't have this idea on day one. What we, did, what we found is as the company grew, the book, the book began to write itself. We didn't set off to say, oh, let's go create a fund that can give money to suppliers when we don't have their buyers. But as we saw that the data was helping us understand something that was important for the supplier, and because they wanted more money, we were able to use that data to secure our feeling about giving money to that supplier. So I, I fully agree with you that there's been too much abuse of data, though I think, I think some of the millennials in the crowd might disagree. I'm, I'm, old, I'm probably older than all of you put together. You don't. We, we, the older generation, have a hard time with people using our data. I don't like it. Uh, but I think if someone were to give me something that I wanted at a price that worked for me because they understood who I was from the data, that might satisfy me. So it's a great question. I think you have to be very careful about how you use the data. But, but to answer your question further, that fund is now one of our biggest buyers. Right? And I think it's going to be 10, maybe 100 times bigger than the biggest buyer we have as it continues to grow. So it might be the most important thing we've ever done. We have to be careful not to abuse the data and make sure that we, we're doing the right thing with that data, though. It's a great question. I think, I think we're out of time. If there are any, any of you that would like to have a conversation about anything, I'll be around a little bit. I'm happy to connect personally. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Mr. Kempas.